Welcome to the Zoom Wednesday Night Bible Study, and thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope that it will be a blessing to you. And if you are watching this second lesson on the book of Romans, it probably means that you were not scared away last week. So welcome back. I know that the book of Romans can be intimidating. And here's why. First, it is a long letter. It is unusually long for a letter in ancient times, and for that matter, even by modern standards. Romans is a long letter. The Apostle Paul makes many incredible and impactful points but only after long and winding arguments. And that leads to the second reason that Romans can be a difficult book to follow. In these long and winding arguments, Paul is also a rabbit chaser. In my opinion, Paul is the patron saint of rabbit chasers. And as a rabbit chaser myself, I respect that. But rabbit chasers, myself included, can be hard to follow. There are times in the book of Romans that Paul is making a point, then he gets sidetracked by chasing that proverbial rabbit, and then two chapters later, he finally gets back to his original argument. And that's sometimes hard to follow. Thirdly, there are several in-depth explanations, long-winded explanations of theological concepts only touched upon in some of Paul's earlier letters. For instance, something he wrote maybe a paragraph about in 2 Corinthians might take up nearly two chapters in the book of Romans. In Galatians, for instance, Paul just touches on the faith of Abraham, the role of Abraham in our faith, and all of the implications of Abraham. But in, in Romans, Paul takes up the same point about Abraham, but he really, really, really expounds on it. The impact of the book of Romans for the good cannot be overestimated. But on the other hand, because of, its complex, because of its complexity, its length, the rabbit chaser, chasing, and the long and winding theological explanations, all of that combined, even though it's good, it can also be bad because Romans has become a gold mine for cherry picking and proof texting. And so for all of those reasons, as I mentioned last week, this study will be taught from the 30,000 foot level. If we can understand the broad themes and see how sections of this letter fit together, maybe, and this is my hope, maybe it will help us to fall in love with the book of Romans. And Understanding Romans from that 30,000 foot level also helps in detecting when someone is cherry picking and proof texting. Now, as promised, there'll be times when we'll dive down and look at a passage more closely. But for the most part, as I use this metaphor of an airplane and me as your pilot for all it's worth, I'm going to keep this study at 30,000 feet, and I hope that that promise will help you come back for lesson number three next week. Now, last week, I introduced the Apostle Paul's letter to the Roman church, and there are many approaches to studying Romans, and there are several valid theories as to the purpose of it. But by reading the last part of Romans first, which we did last week, 
we discovered that Paul was trying to solve the discord between Jewish and Gentile believers. But before he gets there, he gives us 11 chapters of theology. The basis for unity, peace, and hospitality in the universal and local church that's filled with cultural diversity, different opinions, beliefs, and rituals is found in the faithfulness of God demonstrated in the work of Jesus the Christ. That's the point that Paul is trying to make. And he will use a lot of ink to explain what it means to be in Christ. That's the theology. It is in Christ that God forms a new creation. It is in Christ that they, there can be unity in the church despite not having uniformity. And so right off the bat, Paul gives us a preview of the work of Christ and how the resulting transformation of being in Christ will become the basis for that unity. And in Romans chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 16, we get that preview. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, so in Paul's world, there's only two types of people. You're either Jewish or you're not. So when Paul says that in, that's for the Jew first and also for the Greek, he's backing up when he just said that, that the gospel is God's saving power for everyone. For in it, God's covenant justice, and that's often translated righteousness, and that's probably how many of us know this verse, is uh, that for in it, God's righteousness is revealed, but righteousness is God's covenant justice. For in it, God's covenant justice is revealed from faithfulness to faithfulness, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is Paul's preview of what the letter of Romans is going to be all about. And then Paul launches into the first major section of his letter. And, and this is the focus of tonight's lesson. So tonight, in the big picture of things, we're going to cover Romans 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 29. In other words, through chapter 2. And I like how Daniel Kirk summarizes the section as we're in this together. Now, before Paul explains the gospel, before Paul explains that the gospel is God's saving power for everyone who believes, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 229, Paul points out the universal issue of sin. Paul's big picture reason for doing this is summed up so well in Michael Gore, by Michael Gorman in his book, Romans, A Theological and Pastoral Commentary. The recognition of universal Jewish and Gentile sin, judgment and mercy, places Jewish and Gentile believers on the same footing. Now that that's the re, that's that that's going to be the point of Romans one uh, through chapter two. They, both Jews and Gentiles, are equally in debt to God's mercy and equally children of Abraham, who is the paradigm of receiving justification and life by means of grace through faith. There is therefore no room for arrogance or judgmentalism. In the church, Paul's theology of sin, sin and grace, has a pastoral aim. I wanted to include that quote because Michael Gorman also has the view that I share that, that the end result of Paul's letter is about how Jewish and Gentile believers can get along. 
And so what Michael Gorman is doing is, all right, we're about to go into theology, but the end result, keep the end result in mind that in the end, there is no room for arrogance or judgmentalism in the church. That's the aim of talking the theology. So in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 229, Paul points out Gentile sin, which is based in idolatry. Then he will get to Jewish, Jewish sin. And all of this Gentile and Jewish sin will eventually lead up to the statement that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we are all in this together. And the key word is all. We are all in this together. Now, this is a good place to bring up the issue of diatribe tribe. It's yet another reason the book of Romans is often difficult to follow. A diatribe tribe is a rhetorical strategy of dialogue between two imaginary people in order to make a point. In Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18 through 32, Paul assumes a Jewish character who talks about the failures or the sins of them, meaning Gentiles. Then, beginning in chapter 2, we get a grammatical shift from they to you, which then introduces a different character who speaks to the issue of Jewish failures and Jewish sins. And I'm just going to give you a quote from, uh, from uh, Michael Gorman. That is the power of the diatribe. It draws us in, allowing us to be addressed and possibly taught as we find ourselves as both the person questioned and the respondent. Moreover, in this particular passage, the diatribe is helping to make a specific case. God judges impartially on the basis of deeds. So add that into the pile of what makes Romans difficult to follow. Paul uses in, in this passage, and he's gonna do it later, he used this diatribe. Now, let's see how this plays out. Let's look at some of the scriptures as Paul makes the point of the universality of sin by using the rhetorical device of diatribe. So beginning at Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and injustice of those who by their injustice suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Though invisible to the eye, God's eternal power and divinity have been seen since the creation of the universe, understood and clearly visible is all of nature. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't give God honor or praise and never even said thank you. Instead, their reasoning became increasingly empty and inept, and their undiscerning hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal and incorruptible God for mere images images of mortal, corruptible humans and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Then Paul goes into the sexual immorality that was the result of Gentile idolatry. And hang on, we will circle back to that part of Romans chapter 1. 
But for me to get to my point of showing the big picture of what Paul is doing and how he uses rhetorical diatribe to make his point, I'm going to skip to Romans 1, 28. Furthermore, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God, God abandoned them to their own depraved minds. They were driven to do things they shouldn't be done and were filled with every kind of injustice, evil, greed, and malice. They became full of envy, murder, bickering, treachery, and deceit. They became gossips, slanderers, God-haters. They were insolent, arrogant, and boastful, inventors of evil and rebellious to their parents. They were senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Folks, we just know that Paul is setting everybody up here. And even though they knew God's just mandate that everyone who does such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but encouraged others to do the same. Now I'm going to switch to the Message Bible so that we can clearly see the punch of Paul's diatribe. Those people are on a dark spiral downward. But if you think that leaves you on the high ground where you can point your finger at others, think again. See the change? Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. But God isn't so easily diverted. God sees right through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you have done. There we have it. Paul is very wordy in getting there but when he finally finishes, he has powerfully made his point. We are all in this together, Gentiles and Jews. Remember, that covers everyone. Gentiles and Jews, everyone, are equally guilty and are equally in need of God's mercy. And through that mercy demonstrated in Christ Jesus, all will be able to equally live in a new way as the people of God. So from the 30,000 foot level, we are all in this mess together. That's tonight's lesson. Now, you'll have to stay tuned to see how God, in God's faithfulness, provides the way for all to be transformed into that something new. Now, next week, your pilot will circle back around and take us on a controlled descent so that we can examine Romans 1 18 through verse 27 more closely. It is a passage that has been misinterpreted and then weaponized to condemn LGBTQ people. So next week, we'll take a dive. Make sure your seat belts are secured and fastened as we unclobber the clobber passage of Romans 1. Until then, God's abundant grace and peace to you.